Guys, welcome to The Disruptors, the show where we get the folks who are disrupting our view of the future and hopefully making it better. Today, we've got somebody who's doing that and a lot more, Erica Hamda on the program. Thanks for coming today, Erica. Thank you for having me. So I was listening to your TED Talk and it seemed like it was a journey of failure upon failure leading towards success. And I feel like that's what life is when you do something great. So I wanted to, I wanted to start there. What's your, what's your 30,000 foot, 30,000 foot. There's a (laughs) 130,000 foot. (laughs) Yeah. So what's your 130,000 foot overview? Um, yeah, I guess. So for me, it wasn't until the, the final failure that I talk about in the TED talk that I actually looked back on my whole career and realized that it was full of failure because I think I had just accepted that if you're trying to do something new and different, it's not going to work the first like 30 times. So you just have to keep going. But I, it wasn't until I was kind of reflecting on things that um, I realized like, Oh, my entire life is failure. But, but I didn't really realize it at the time. I just kept going. And that's what you need to do to be able to do something great. And I think you're well on the way to doing that. How did you get into, how did you get into space astrophysics? Why did you become obsessed with this stuff? Um, so it's actually like a pretty nice story. I was in like first or second grade and I, my mom came into the, my room and she said, oh, some scientists are having a contest for um, people to rename the Big Bang because all astronomy names are very terrible. And, and um so this would have been like the late eighties. And I looked at her and I said, what's the big bang? And she was like, Oh, go look it up. So I went to our encyclopedia and I looked up the big bang. And that was the first time that I realized that the universe like existed in the way that we conceive of it. And um, that the earth goes around the sun and that there are like stars and galaxies. And, and our encyclopedia had this Atlas at the back um, in the, in the last book. And so I looked up, in the atlas it had this map of the solar system that had a map of the galaxy and that had a map of like the known universe and i remember like my seven-year-old self looking at that and thinking like oh my god this is the greatest thing that i've ever heard of and that was basically it i like would go to the library and take out books about space and like watch all these um tv shows on pbs about space and i was just always really into it do you think that people have some type of fate or something aligning them or is it just the conditions kind of aligning could the same thing have happened for you if you had been watching the land before time or something and your mom had brought home a dinosaur bone i don't know i guess i i like don't really think there is anything like fate like i'm kind of a nihilist i feel like the universe doesn't care and like nothing matters but (laughs) um but i also think that people like everyone is the mozart of something they just maybe don't know what it is so i feel like Um, I lucked out that I figured out what I really liked and what like really spoke to me really early on. But I think that things like that exist for everybody. It's just a question of like whether they are in a position to realize it and take advantage of it. And then kind of the timing, like if you're the Mozart of like building, I don't know, space telescopes, but you were born in 1000, like that's going to suck for you, but (laughs) you could build telescope telescopes, but (laughs) I'm definitely, I definitely don't believe in fate either. But what I meant more of is, do you think it's that there is the Mozart of X and the Mozart of Y, or do you think it could be Mozart becomes one thing or the other thing based off of the conditions that he grows up? Yeah. So how much do you think is of that inherent desire you have is internal and how much do you think it was weighed on by outside forces um i think it's i think it's a combination i guess which is probably an unsatisfying answer but i think a lot of it was internal because i had opportunities to go into other sciences or even into like medicine and i just it never really spoke to me the way that learning about space did um And I did actually explore a different career path. Um, After college, I worked as a chef for a year. I went to cooking school and worked in a restaurant. And um, it was, it was good. And I learned a lot and I was good at it, but it, it didn't have the same, um, I don't know. It didn't like resonate in my soul the way that the work that I do now does. Soul says the astrophysicist. (laughs) Yes. In my like heart, it didn't, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't like get me up in the morning in the same way that the work I do now. I like the purpose wasn't as big. You have yeah. a big purpose now. Yeah. What is your purpose? T- talk me through what you do on a day-to-day basis and why it matters. 
So I guess my purpose is that I want to, I want us to know more about the universe that we live in. And I want to know why for like almost everything. I want to know like, why does our galaxy exist? And like, why does our star exist? And why do, why does our planet exist? And, um, I guess the, my question of why is not like in a deep, like spiritual way. It's more just like, well, how did this happen? Like what, what cascade of processes had to occur in the correct order in order for us to be here and like asking questions. And, um, so a lot of my day, like I don't spend so much time thinking about those like really big, cause that's like a big question. Like why does our planet exist? I don't think about that in necessarily, but I like work on things that will lead us to a tiny piece of the answer. So right now, most of my days are, are occupied by this, um, a proposal for a space telescope that I'm developing. Um, and it's a proposal that we're going to submit to NASA on August 1st. And it's this like huge project. It's a collaboration between the University of Arizona, um, Ball Aerospace, Ames Research Center, and a few other places. And it's um, a telescope that will investigate the molecular clouds that um, create stars. So it's part of trying to answer the question of like, well, how did our star form? Um, and it's the first project that I've like totally originated. Um, the telescope that I talk about in my TED talk was a project that um, one of my advisors had come up with and I was sort of took over and worked on it, but it wasn't originally my idea. And this telescope concept is really like my own thing. So um, that process has been really interesting because I, um, it's like really scary to come up with your own idea and to say like, oh, I think this question that I have about the universe is interesting and valid and all these other people should work on it. And NASA should give us a ton of money to build it and make it happen. Absolutely. Um, so molecule, molecule clouds building stars can walk me through what exactly this is. Cause this is way over my head. And I'm, oh, sure. <laughs> so, um, okay. So the big bang happens and basically the universe is full of hydrogen. That is the main element that's created in the Big Bang. And hydrogen is the most simple element. It has one proton and one electron and that's it. Um, and hydrogen will have the tendency to collaborate into pairs. So like two hydrogen atoms will um, bond together and they form molecular hydrogen. And molecular hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. Um, but a molecule is just any collection of more than one atom. Um, so you can have much more complex molecules, which is like what makes up a human, where you can have this very simple one that's just two hydrogen atoms stuck together. And um, when we look out into the galaxy, we, you can see these huge clouds of molecular hydrogen. Um, a lot of the most beautiful images from Hubble are actually molecular clouds. They're these um, really denser regions where they look like there's lots of activity happening there. They tend to be like lit up by the stars that have been formed in the clouds. So they look really beautiful. Um, like the Orion Nebula is a molecular cloud. Any nebula really is going to be a molecular cloud. Um, and we know that they're the, the locations of star formation because every place that's forming new stars is in a molecular cloud. But we don't know the exact connection between um, the cloud and the rate at which it forms stars. So we can't look at a cloud and say, oh, in, a, in 1 million years, this cloud is gonna start forming stars and this other cloud won't. We just like sort of see this correlation, but we don't have a full understanding of it. And so the mission I'm working on is designed to try and um, figure out if that correlation is a real thing or not, basically. And to figure out if it's a cause or if it's an effect. So if you're seeing what's happening first or what comes after. Yeah, exactly. And like, is the, um, like maybe the molecular clouds, um, the molecular hydrogen is correlated with some other thing. And that thing is what's driving the star formation um, and not the hydrogen itself. Interesting. Interesting. And how did you stumble upon this as something that would be interesting to look into? Um, so it's a little convoluted. <laughs> um, so my work, a lot of my work is focused on like very faint things in the universe and uh, on like diffuse hydrogen. So there are astronomers who study um, denser objects. So like if you study stars, like a star is really dense and um, it's also hydrogen, but it's kind of in a different like state of matter. Um, or if you study planets, that's obviously like denser than just like random molecules of hydrogen out in the universe. But a lot of my work is focused on like really faint things. 
and really diffuse things. And so um, the work that I talked about in my TED talk, that telescope was focused on these huge clouds of um, atomic hydrogen, so just like a single hydrogen atom um, that are around really distant galaxies. And um, I had sort of been thinking about the um, type of telescope that you that you would build to detect that hydrogen is primarily an ultraviolet telescope, and my expertise is in a lot of ultraviolet technology. And so, um, going from just atomic hydrogen to molecular hydrogen is like a pretty small step, but um, it puts you in this different regime. You go from really distant galaxies to um, just nearby star forming regions in our own galaxy. Um, and so I was sort of thinking like, well, how can I observe molecular hydrogen in our galaxy and what are the interesting questions about it? And that um, led me to this um, kind of idea of like, well, we don't really know that much about the connection to star formation. And so maybe I can explore a little more there. Were you a nerd growing up, Star Wars or Star Trek? Um, I was like really into Star Wars. I've never gotten into Star Trek, mostly like I just haven't watched a lot of it. Um, but I like read a lot of books. I still read a lot. And I um, I like have sort of a, an obsessive personality. So I will like get into something and then I get like really into it. And that, that lasts for a while. And then it's like the next thing. So for a while, I was also really into the X-Files um, back when they were on. And... Um, yeah, I like, I just get, uh, I'm trying to think of what other stuff, like for, I was really into like reading Isaac Isimov uh, for a while and it kind of just like flitted around, but it's always like pretty. Does that inspire your work? Um, I don't know. I think it's more just that I like thinking about space and so stories that are set in space, like, or I always identify with, I want to be an astronaut. And so I think part of that um, you know, I like, I like all of that stuff. Do you think there's a role for astronauts in space or is it more, uh, this is awesome to do. So we got to do it type deal. Um, I think that there is a role for astronauts in space. Um, mostly because we eventually need to go somewhere else and, the time to start working on that is like yesterday. And so you might as well just do it. Um, and I, I think the, like, it reminds me a lot of basic scientific research, which is that you fund a study and you don't really know what's going to come out of it. I mean, most of astronomy research is like this where you're like, well, let's just, we have this question. There's this weird thing we want to know about. So let's explore it. And then you invent the internet, but it, someone at the beginning of that study would have never, predicted like, oh, this thing is going to be really useful for all of humanity. And so I feel like um, human space exploration is kind of like that, where you, I think it's important to explore and to understand like our solar system and the, the universe around us. And so that's one way of doing it. Um, and I think the, you know, there's a lot that you can learn by sending robots and by doing like telescope observations, but um, sending people I think you, people have a different perspective. And also I feel like it's valuable just um, kind of aspirationally um, that like, I personally loved reading about all the Apollo missions and about the early NASA days as a kid. And I feel like that inspired me um, in a lot of ways. And so even if we never discovered anything or didn't um, invent anything because of those missions, like just the fact that I don't know, like three generations of people have been inspired by that is almost worth the money. Now we're inspired by the new iPhone. It's a, it's a great progression. <laughs> so so you, you've rolled up a, it sounds like a pretty big initiative with NASA, private enterprise, universities in terms of putting together this proposal. What's that like? Well, it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, it's been like very challenging because a lot of like you go into science and you kind of think like, oh, I don't need to have any people skills and I'm never going to have to like talk in front of a crowd. And <laughs> but in fact, that's like all that I do is like bring, I have to convince people that my idea is worth investing in. And so I have to like pitch things to people and um, kind of talk people into stuff and give these presentations. And then you have to like actually be a good writer um, in writing the proposal. Like you want someone to enjoy reading it. So it's been it's a lot of stuff that I, if you had asked me like 10 years ago what I would need to have skills in, I would have not have listed them. But um, it's also 
pretty exciting because you, I've met a lot of different people and the, you know, working with an aerospace company, they, there are a lot of ex academics, but they sort of have different motivations. And so it's interesting to see what they think is important versus what I think is important. Um, and, and yeah, mostly it's been fun. It just takes a lot of time and it's a lot of traveling. I'm like always all over the place. How do you think about that public private partnership and where we're headed when it comes to space? Um, I think it's really important because I think, so I, back when um, the space shuttle was being retired and the idea was that NASA was going to buy tickets for its astronauts on private um, rockets. And I, and I feel like actually that's correct. That's like the right way to do things. And I think of the analogy of like the right, if the Wright brothers invented the airplane and then nobody else flew airplanes for the next like 60 years that like, it's not really a good way to make progress. Like you need people to be um, competing against each other and, and trying to innovate. And I feel like NASA's role should be in doing things that were previously impossible or like exploring well beyond like low earth orbit. They should be doing things that are, that are like the basic research of space exploration. And so just, you know, having a reusable space vehicle is not doing that. And so I, I, I think that's good. And I also feel like all of the rocket launches, um, like people like SpaceX just had a launch last night and people get so excited about them and they like post about them on the internet and everyone, I, I think that having more like players in the field increases the public's um, interest and that's also a really useful thing. Especially when we're launching off of a flat earth. <laughs> and, uh, it definitely yeah. it definitely can raise some questions so yes i i think there's incredible places where we're going to in space what what technologies and trends in that area not necessarily just in your work but in everything that you come in contact with are you most excited about so i have to say that i am most excited about um like commercial space flight for tourists um not just because like i would like to go to space <laughs> But um, because I think that's going to be a really positive thing for humanity, like the more people that are able to go to space and see the earth from above, I think the better off our society will be. And partly that's because um, there's this um, effect that astronauts have described or anyone that's gone to space, they describe what's called the overview effect. Um, is it the overview effect? Let me check that. Um, it's, where like, it's like the LSD effect. Everyone is one suddenly. Yeah. So yeah, it's called the overview effect. And it's this like shift in awareness where they, um, someone who is in space can see like a huge chunk of the earth and there's like, no, this, there's no borders. There's no, um, there's no differentiation between places and that they feel like, oh my God, this is this like valuable um, like tiny beautiful spot and we have to do everything we can to protect it and we have to like we're all like one um, just like one species on this planet and not individual countries and not individual factions and that um, they they sort of are like profoundly changed by it and I think um, a few astronauts have said like oh if you could just send politicians to space like we would not have any problems and that might be like an overly optimistic point of view, but I think having more people to have that effect to see like, wow, this is like, this is really important. We have one little place in this like hostile blackness. Um, I think that could really make a, a huge difference. There's um, a theory that the environmental movement in the seventies was partly um, the result of the first images coming back from the Apollo missions from Apollo um, seven or eight, which were the first ones to see the earth as a perfect sphere against the blackness of space. That was the first time that we had images of like the entire globe and that people um, seeing those pictures, they realized like, oh wow, like this is this matters, this is really important. Um, so I think that the idea that all these different companies are striving to get tourists into space and that regular people or really just rich people could buy tickets into space, I think maybe that could have a really big impact um, in a positive way. Yeah, it's all it's all perspective. Do you think they'll be able to mimic that with virtual reality experiences or do you think it's something you're going to have to see to believe? 
Um, I don't know. I think you have to, I think you have to feel it like going up there, like the feeling of microgravity and, and seeing the earth like spinning below you. Um, yeah, I guess it depends on how good your virtual reality system is, but I feel like it's, it's going to be the experience that does it. Yeah. It's not the, it's not the destination. It's the journey as well. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating the whole the whole movement and as the rich billionaires go up and have their pissing contest to see <laughs> who can get people to space and who can build the houses and have all the fun it will start to bring the costs down but it is still so expensive that's the big yeah i mean um, you know you're trying to you're trying to launch telescopes into space what's it what's it cost to get a decent telescope into space so my telescope is like relatively small the primary mirror is 40 centimeters um which is not big for contrast the hubble space telescope primary mirror is 2.3 meters so it's way bigger um so the cost of the mission for me is 145 million dollars um which is like the science the actual design, building it, testing it, um, operating it once it's in space. But then there's a separate $50 million on top of that, which is just for the launch. So basically we're assuming it's $50 million to get it into space. And, and what, it's, it's okay. not that big. It's like a couple hundred kilograms. It's, it's not giant. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a pretty decent ride sharing cost. What, <laughs> is, uh, what, what was Hubble? I know Hubble took something like 40, 44 years. Yeah, so um, the guy who first came up with the idea of like a, a telescope in space, um, it was 44 years before it got actually got launched. It was launched in 1993. Um, but the costs are kind of hard to quantify because it costs like several billion dollars. Um, but that's if you don't count the cost of the space shuttle. Um, and the space shuttle, in, a, in astronomy anyway, most people think that the number one um, use of the space shuttle was the fact that it launched the Hubble Space Telescope and then it repaired it the first time around and then it went back to do the upgrades um, and and that one of the major um, kind of contributions of the shuttle program was actually just HST. Um, so if you count like the entire space shuttle program then it becomes very expensive but um, Hubble is in a separate class of mission so my mission is, is what NASA would qualify as a small explorer and so small explorers are, um, they happen every like two to three years and they're these like targeted investigations um, that are just trying to answer one specific science question. And you can use them for other stuff. And typically they have, um, in our proposal, we propose for a two year mission, but because things are built so well, they usually last for like 10 to 15 years. Um, whereas Hubble is in this different class of missions that's called a flagship. So they're like several billion dollars and it's, um, they're designed to last for, as long as possible, 10 years, 25 years. Um, and um, so that's like a whole kind of separate category of missions and they try out a lot of things and it's designed to do as much as possible. It's not just a single question. It's like, how many questions can we answer with this telescope? What are the biggest ones that Hubble's answered so far? Um, so Hubble has helped us figure out um, the expansion of the universe and um, I'm like, gee, what question hasn't Hubble answered? <laughs> um, it's answered questions like a ton of questions about how galaxies evolve through time um, and about like our own solar system. Um, before, when, when we don't have missions to like the outer planets, like for example, Pluto, before we sent that, um, the probe to Pluto, the best images that we had were from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and HST has taken pictures of like auroras on Jupiter and Saturn so we can investigate their magnetic fields. Um, and yeah, a ton of stuff just in our own solar system and then in our own galaxy, um, understanding about how stars form um, and how they like live throughout time. And then, yeah, I'm thinking like in terms of distance, so then the next thing is like how galaxies evolve and then it just gets bigger and bigger. Questions each. like fundamental properties of the universe. Yeah. So it's really done an incredible amount of work. I mean, it's been operating for um, 25 years, more than that. And, um, and it's, it's been like almost a priceless mission. And there's a couple more larger telescopes, is my understanding. Kepler, I believe, that coming forward to search primarily, or not maybe primarily, but to search largely for... Uh, 
Goldilocks type planets? Yeah, so Kepler, um, that the primary mirror I think was smaller than Hubble, um, but Kepler is an example of one of those missions that was a very focused science question. So it's question was just what is the frequency of Earth like planets or of planets actually. Um, and so it just looked at a single spot in the sky and had this huge um, detector area, like a, uh, the focal plane um, was looking at, I think over a hundred thousand stars. And all that it did was take pictures on, at a particular cadence. And um, it was looking for when a planet goes in front of a star and the light from the star will dim just like by a couple of percent um, as the planet passes in front and then the planet goes back around as it's orbiting and then that dip is going to be repeated at the same you know on a certain like orbital time scale so you can say oh this planet this star has a planet and this star doesn't have a planet and this star does have a planet and so kepler was a, very successful in figuring out that many planets are actually very common um, and so that actually that mission is getting shut down it's been operating for a while um, but there is a um, Another mission that just went up that's called TESS, which is looking for Earth-like planets, and that's scanning the entire sky. Um, whereas Kepler was just focused on this one spot, um, TESS is looking across like everywhere we can see. And then there's another mission, which is sort of a, the next flagship that's called the James Webb Space Telescope, JWST. Uh, yeah. yeah, and that is giant. The primary mirror is like eight meters or something crazy. Um, and it's made of segmented um, hexagonal shaped like sub mirrors. Um, but that telescope is in the infrared. So the Hubble Space Telescope has capability in the ultraviolet, the visible, and the infrared, and JWST is just going to be in the infrared. So in some ways it's better because it's larger and it's more sensitive, but in other ways it, it doesn't have the same uh, capability. And then right now the astronomy community is coming up with concepts for like the next flagship that would be after JWST, something that would go up in like the 2030s. And um, so there's four different like large mission concepts that are being explored. And one of them is, is sort of just like a, a larger, better version of Hubble. Uh, but we're going to need that because one day Hubble is going to stop working and we will need a really good UV and visible wavelength telescope in space. And it takes a while to build a backup plan. Yeah. So um, all of these things just take like an enormous amount of time and effort over so many more years than you than you might think is it speeding up now with uh i know on the on the micro and small sat side of things things are moving much faster now thanks to cell phones and off the off the shelf parts yeah um some things are faster but at least for astronomy you almost are always trying to do something new that no, that has never happened before and so even if certain parts of the spacecraft are really like easy to make. There's going to be some some part of your instrument or your detector that is totally new and is going to take a lot of time to get right. Um, so, at least with with these big astrophysics missions, if it were easy or like someone had already done it, you wouldn't bother putting it in space. You only are trying to build it if there's no other way to answer the question and and um, Typically, it's because there's something new that's available to you. Like my sort of theory of, of astrophysics is that you invent a new technology, like something that will improve your telescope or a new detector, and then that motivates a mission, and then that's how you discover new things. But you have to have like this new way of looking at the universe in order to um, actually discover anything. Stepwise change. So, yeah. so speaking of... Fermi paradox solutions and the search for intelligent life. What are, what are your thoughts and do you have any theories in terms of why we haven't seems to have found anything? Um, so I think that life, I like agree with um, Jeff Goldblum's character from the original Jurassic Park movie that life finds a way. Um, and I think there's probably life everywhere, um, which is exciting because um, it's going to be like super weird and interesting when we ever actually go and explore it. Um, and I think it's, I guess I think like, well, we're not particularly special. We're like in a relatively boring galaxy around a like quiet, boring star, which is helpful for the evolution of life on earth. But I also think like nothing about us is particularly extraordinary. And so I would assume that there's lots of places that have intelligent life. Um, the distances are so huge that, 
it's hard from like where I sit now to say like, oh, how would you visit another one of those um, civilizations or how would you even communicate with it? Um, I think that's actually the problem is just that the distances are so vast. Um, and I mean, it's possible that in 300 years, we'll have invented something that will make those distances crossable. I don't know. I don't want to like, I, I can, I'm, my imagination is limited by like the reality in which we reside. So <laughs> it's it hard is to and It isn't. So you're also, we're a fan of Asimov and, and yeah. Star Wars. So like maybe there's some way, um, how much of that is wishful that. thinking because of the childhood and how much of that is true? I'm an astrophysicist and I'm thinking about this like a left-brained person. <laughs> um, I think it's a combination of both. Like I don't want to be closed off to the possibilities, but I also know that like I can't, um, like I don't know the things that I don't know. And so I don't want to say like, oh, it's impossible to travel faster than light because I don't know enough about the fabric of space time to really rule that out um i feel like a lot of people forget that they don't know what they don't know scientists <laughs> everyday folks and it creates a lot of problems yeah i do think i'm like hyper aware of my own shortcomings <laughs> you're always um, asking why you're, you're like the toddler asking why just trying to yeah oh yeah i like i'm very good with toddlers that i can like take them all the way to the end of that chain but then it usually ends with like gravity and i don't have a good answer for that um but, uh, but so I think there's probably intelligent life. I think the pessimist in me would say like, well, any, like, any species that involves, that evolves and is curious and like outward looking the way that our species is, is gonna potentially have a natural tendency to destroy itself. And so the, in the like Fermi paradox or Drake's equation, there's a, um, one of the terms is like, how long does your intelligent life actually last to tell whether or not you ever have an overlap between intelligent civilizations in a galaxy? And I think that's really the like part where things break down that like, I think life is probably everywhere, um, but it might be just cellular, like single celled organisms are really simple. And um, having like a, another species that you could have a conversation with, I don't know how frequent that would be. Um, but I think it would be like, it would be super interesting. I like, this is sort of related, but I really love octopuses partly because I feel like they're the closest thing to like an alien intelligence that their like environment is so weird and different. Um, so I feel like it would be awesome if there were like intelligent aliens and we could somehow like discover that. But I also, um, I don't know. I'm not holding my breath for it. I'm not holding my breath. The, the the most credible solutions I've heard would be the simulation hypothesis. Life is much more rare than we think, or the, the dark forest deal. Basically, if you think about it long enough, why aren't we hearing anything? Maybe it's because there's some super smart civilization out there killing everybody, so we shouldn't say anything. Because if that <laughs> is the case, we're all screwed. So it it's, it's essentially boils down to one of those three. How much do, yeah. how much do those type of conversations go around the the cafeteria, so to speak, when you guys are meeting together, you've got astrophysicists and other folks focused on space, all sitting down, having lunch. So I would say almost never. <laughs> it's most of those conversations are when I'm talking with like non-astrophysics people. Um, and our, our conversations are more, um, I don't want to say politics focused, but they're kind of more focused on like what's happening at NASA, what's happening. Okay. So speaking of what we, we got to jump into it, we got to jump into it. Then you set yourself up hook, line and sinker for that one. So, what politics focused. <laughs> yeah. So how, how is that? How is that situation with, we'll just say an interesting president with interesting ideas affecting yeah. you, affecting NASA, affecting applying for funding, affecting academia. So, well, when I said politics was before, I meant more just like NASA politics, but, um, but I would say NASA is somewhat insulated from things. Um, the, like everyone loves space. Anytime I tell people about my job, they're always like, oh my God, space is so interesting. And then we like talk about it for a long time. Um, so I would say like NASA is relatively bipartisan. Um, the, it has a lot of ties with the defense community. Um, and so in some sense, NASA, NASA's budget tends to go up during Republican administrations more than it does during Democratic administrations, but it is a priority for both um, 
parties. And um, really the thing that matters actually is that the NASA budget is so small compared to the rest of the federal government. It's like a half a percent. Um, a lot of people think it's a lot more, but it's really, you get a lot of space bang for your tax dollar. Um, and, but it's small enough that an individual member of Congress can make a tremendous difference in the NASA budget. Um, so there used to be a Republican congressman named John Culberson who represented um, a suburb of Houston. And he like loved NASA. He was super into space. Um, and he like was on the um, house committee that decides the NASA budget. He knew everything about it. He's, he was really a proponent of this mission to land on Europa, which is one of the moons of Jupiter, because we think there's a subsurface ocean under like an, a layer of ice. And his belief was like, well, if we do the Europa lander, you like dig into the ice and you could discover that there's life in the ocean that everyone's gonna flip out and the NASA budget will like quadruple. Um, so he was very oriented on getting NASA's budget to be larger and exploration and discovery. And so he would um, like work with other members of Congress who didn't prioritize NASA as much, but they had other priorities. And so they would work together to, to keep the NASA budget strong or to increase it or to protect it. Um, he lost in 2018, so now NASA is a little bit without a um, sort of their champion. Um, one of the former senators from um, Maryland, uh, Barbara Mokowski, I think is her name, she was also really into NASA, um, and so she was helpful, but she retired a number of years ago. And so, so the politics is less about like who's in the White House and more about um, is there a, an individual member of Congress who is just like really into NASA? And I actually talked to John Culberson a couple of years ago and I asked him like, so what happened? Like, how did you get so into space so that we could do that to everybody? But he, he was sort of like me actually, he said he just was like really into it since he was a child. And um, unlike me, he didn't go into academics, but he kept that like sort of love of, of space and discovery um, even in his job as a Congressman. Is that personalization a feature or a bug of democracy? It seems like there's a lot of benefits if you can take advantage of it, but there's also a lot of inherent weaknesses because we're all humans. And if we have humans deciding based off of what their personal preferences are, it seems, uh, it seems problematic in a lot of ways. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, was it, I think it's Winston Churchill who said like democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other forms. <laughs> so it's, too sure. I think, yeah, everything is like, is just very personal, per personality based. I think there's no getting around it. And um, I mean, if we were, at least the way that things are structured now, where you have like representatives who are not going to be a perfect embodiment of all of their constituents. And maybe if you had like direct democracy, like where people, every person votes on everything. But even then, I, that might just be a giant mess. Um, I think if we can just get the corporate tax dollars or corporate dollars out of campaign finance, that would be a big, a big step in the right direction. Yeah. And I think if you ask people about their, their priorities, like when the American public is polled about what do they think we should spend money on, or what do you think we're spending money on? Um, I think space would be a lot higher. Uh, discovery would be a lot higher of like a fraction of the federal budget than it is now. Um, and, and I think the, the reality of like how money is spent does not reflect what um, an individual American or even like a conglomeration of Americans. I don't think it's really how they would choose to spend that money. Um, Definitely not. Which I think is a big failure of our politics. Um, and Or a success of lobbying. It just depends on which way you look at it. So yeah. you brought it up a little bit earlier, the um, NASA's ties with military and defense. How do you think about that as an astrophysicist? I know physicists in the past have had their technology and their work a lot of times co-opted or funded by government. I mean, Manhattan Project, among other things. Yeah. How do you think about science and the military? Um, I think it's like a, it's a devil's bargain a little bit. Um, so personally for my own work, so I work in the ultraviolet, which is basically useless for every other um, yeah, unless you want to yeah, yeah, you can go give people skin cancer and that's not what you got, right? <laughs> yeah, but like you can't build a spy satellite in the ultraviolet because the atmosphere absorbs everything. So there's nothing to see. You can't use it on the ground because the atmosphere absorbs everything. So um, in some sense, that's partly why the ultraviolet 
is a little bit behind compared to other wavelength ranges in astronomy because there isn't this outside um, group that wants to use the technology. Whereas like the infrared, um, the infrared is super useful for military applications. It's really great for night vision. It's good for like a ton of things. And so there's a lot of the technology that people, um, even here at the University of Arizona who work in the infrared, the technology is export controlled um, or you have to have a security clearance to do certain things. And it's a lot harder in some ways to just focus on your science question, but at the same time, there's a lot more money available if you wanted to use that money to develop your technology. Um, but I think for me, I, um, I don't have a strong interest in helping um, anybody make their bombs like more efficient or better. So I'm happy that my wavelength range, like I don't actually have to, I'm not really confronted with that choice because um, it's not useful for any military application. But historically, like, you know, if you want to do your work, you need funding from somewhere. So people will take the money that's available to them. Um, and I don't know, I don't think that that, um, that's not really something that I'm interested in. What do you think about the scientists? This is a super common one with scientists and technologists. We just created it. It's not really our fault how it gets used. So, I mean, that goes everywhere from Facebook to the atomic bomb to everything yeah. in between. How do, how do you think about that view? Do scientists and technologists have a, a duty? Because every, every advance, every innovation is a double-edged sword. It can be used for good and for bad. Do, do um, they have an obligation? I think... Yeah, I think that scientists in general have an obligation to the society that supports them. And I think like um, that sentence like, oh, well, I just invented it. I'm not responsible for like whoever takes it and uses it is like a pretty big cop out. Um, in a lot of cases, you know what you're making it for. Um, like the people working on the Manhattan Project, they like, I don't think they had any illusions about what the point of it was. Um, and I think, I think part of it is that um, historically science has been done by people who um, felt like they didn't need to be political or that politics didn't affect them because they were the default person that everything like sort they're, of- Yeah, they were the elites. Them. Yeah, and so it's easy to say like, oh, well, I'm, I'm not political because you don't think that any of those political decisions affect you. Um, but as science becomes more um, representative of American society, I think that more people are aware of like um, the context in which they operate, that if you invent something, like it's going to have an impact and you're responsible for it. Um, and, and I think the, um, a lot of stuff doesn't, is not that surprising. Like um, you, you write an algorithm that has all of your biases and then are surprised that it can't recognize like black faces or, um, or that it um, targets certain people over other people. Like, I think um, to me, that all seems very obvious. Like, well, you, it's, it's obvious in hindsight though, but think about it. If you, let's say you go into a crowded room, are you able to identify the different how many people are self-aware enough even to realize that, oh, I had too much bread at lunch and that's why I feel like shit and I'm being a dick to my coworker. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like, how self-aware can we expect people to be when people are, I mean, a lot of people are barely more than more than people, if that makes sense. Well, I would like a small sidebar here to say that bread is the greatest thing ever invented, so. <laughs> oh, it is, but if you cut it out, you'll feel so much better. No, oh my that's God. A whole not, that's a whole nother story. We could have a whole other podcast about bread. <laughs> my wife is Swiss, um, so she's a big fan. Okay. Um, I guess I think, so like I hold people to a high standard, so I feel like if you're running a giant company or you're like doing something that has a huge impact on society, like you should be self-aware enough to, to, to know what you're actually doing. And I, I assume like if you, um, you know, if you run a social media company that has a lot of Nazis on it and you don't mind that, then like maybe you're just okay with them. Um, but I, I feel like um, if you allow, like if, if you're doing something that's gonna have this like world impact, then you, you have a responsibility to 
think about it more than someone who's just like making a garden in their backyard or something that is going to impact a very small number of people. Um, I feel like. I would definitely agree. I feel like there's a slippery slope though. So I hear a lot of people in tech arguing, why in God's name would you let XYZ stay on the platform? They're clearly an XYZ. It doesn't matter yeah. what it is. And, but I always come back to the quote, the path to hell is paved in good intention. So maybe you like the way that Zuckerberg kicks off neo-Nazis today, but what happens when tomorrow someone else is leading that same company and the precedent's already been set of el eliminating people from the conversation or from news results or from X, Y, Z. It's like, who do you want deciding these things? It, it's kind of like if you look at the American presidency over the last 50, 100 years, every successive president has taken a, just a little bit more power for themselves as the president. Initially, it was more or less kind of a dude who was a little bit above everybody else who was in charge of the executive branch with almost none of the powers that he has today. Today, it's slipped much, much, much further from that, where you have the most powerful human being on earth. And it always tends in that direction because power doesn't like to give itself up. How, how do we avoid a slippery slope like that? And that's, that's what I think a lot, not a lot of people think about. And when they react really instinctively to, oh my God, he just said the worst thing about Jews or Muslims or whatever it may be. And I, I'm very much left-leaning, but those are just thoughts that I feel like not a lot, a lot of people think about. Well, I guess like I find slippery slope arguments to be sort of uh, uncompelling because I find that they're, it's just like you're, it's an argument to the absurd outcome, which typically does not happen. So like in terms of like, you know, likelihood it's low. So part of me is just like, eh, whatever. But I know that's not a very good response. But um, I also think like the, um, you know, we have like a, uh, a set of laws that our society is supposed to be based on and um, something like a Facebook or like a Twitter or a social media company, like um, they're a private company. So they, sh they should do whatever they want to make the experience better for their users. And if the experience is bad for their users, their users should go somewhere else. But they're, they're sort of acting as monopolies. And so I feel like you could address it from like a public utility standpoint. Um, and, or you could look to other countries. So like Germany has um, a lot of laws about free speech that are different from you know, the American conception of free speech. And the experience of using social media in that country is totally different than the one in America. So it's possible to like do things and not be stifling people's, um, you know, views in a way that is also safe for the community of users. Um, but I also think that like you brought up, well, who's deciding what views get censored or not. And I would say, well, we're already doing that. Um, the ch choices that are made about what's worthwhile to report, like what to put on the front cover of the New York times, like people are making those decisions today and they're not, Necessarily but it's a lot of people. It's not one person making the decision for the entire world. I mean, in some cases, it's it's one person making the decision for a whole the New York you know, Times company the or Post. yeah. Um, so it, it is the it is that way now, um, and I think it's always been that way. We're just like becoming aware of it, and there's going to be pushback because the people who have had that opportunity to decide what matters and what doesn't matter, those people haven't had to answer to anybody. And it's becoming now where more people have a voice. And um, so it's not a question of whether or not one person gets to decide what views come out. It's a question of who that person is. Yes. But and before, before we we, I would do say we before we person? never had, a, we never had a say in that. And now more people have, um, can like agitate for something. I think the, um, um, the idea, I guess, I guess what we haven't touched on is the fact that, um, so there was a, an article a couple of weeks ago about, um, the YouTube algorithm oh, and God. how it, yeah. And so I would say like, well, that is a whole committee of people making a choice that they want to lead a viewer into this like terrible rabbit hole. Um, and so I, I think, um, 
I think that it has to get addressed and right now we're doing a pretty shit job of it. So I feel like um, I'd be open to a lot of other options. I guess um, I think there's a lot of ways that you can do it. You don't have to just have one person. You can make it a lot more transparent or a lot more like democratic. Um, I think changing the business model would solve almost all of it. So the problem yeah. with the YouTube algorithms is, and, and Facebook's ads and the general nature of the platform is, their entire goal is to get you to click on something. And yeah. when is the last time you clicked on a freaking ad? You just don't do it. So, <laughs> so their business model is not to find the right ad for you, but to create the right consumer for the ad. And you're more likely to buy something if you're angry, if you're upset, if you're feeling fat, if you're missing your boyfriend, if you're X, Y, Z, more or less, when you're feeling like shit, you're more likely to buy something. So the algorithms are designed to bring you further and further along towards the other types of people that have bought things, which just happen to be more extreme versions of what you are. So they make you more extreme without realizing it. Right. Um, the whole ad yeah. model is messed up. The ad model and like the, the currency is attention, I think is a, is a problem. Um, mm. but, um, yeah, I like, I don't, solve the problem, yeah. I don't know. That's what I'm thinking about. Cause I hate saying like, oh, this is a problem, but then not offering a solution. I feel like it's really easy to, to criticize and say, well, this is being done incorrectly, um, without being able to suggest an alternative. Um, uh, and, and the solution as much as it sucks is these goddamn paywalls where you know, people pay for content and pay for the services that they want and use. Now, yeah. like for instance, I was driving home with, uh, with my wife and we're driving along with the GPS and it, it's Google Maps because that's what's on my phone. The defaults are dangerous. But <laughs> I, I see now when I'm driving, it shows me my speed on the, on the phone. It's just like, oh, geez. Google's tracking that now. I wonder which insurance company they're going to sell that to. And that's kind of the, the world of free is actually the world of not so free. The costs are just hidden. Yeah. Well, you are the product if it's free. You are. Yeah. You are the product yeah. in a lot of ways. And it's, I mean, I think, so I guess like there's a tendency in American society, I think to um, assign individual blame for what are actually like, collective choices um so the idea that like each of us should stop using plastic straws because of trash in the ocean um that like that puts the blame on my individual choice to use a straw and not on the like larger society in which i am have no choice but to participate in if that makes sense and so i kind of the I feel incentives like, are wrong and yeah. we aren't addressing the incentives instead of yeah. addressing the action. So it's like, if you want to lose weight, get the junk food out of your house. Once you have it systematized, it's impossible not to happen. And those right. are the things that we're not doing with climate change. The things we're not doing with media. Yeah. That like this, this is such a cliche, but like the system is operating the way that it's supposed to. And yeah, the system's uh, fucked. Well, I think the, the system is bad, but it's like the people who are supposed to be rewarded are getting rewarded and, the people who um, don't matter, don't matter. And I feel like that's the issue. It's like a systemic problem and not um, a question of individual choices. So like, sure, you personally could decide that like, you're gonna go on a, a social media diet or you're gonna stop using Google Maps or you're gonna leave your phone at home. Um, but that makes, that like requires a level of effort from you that is almost unsustainable. Um, like I was traveling and, and got um take out sushi with a friend of mine and he was saying like oh I, like it's so annoying how there's so much um uh like waste with getting this meal and like wouldn't it be better if everyone carries around like a little ceramic thing and you can just like have them give you your food and your your own personal takeout thing and i was like yeah that would be great but like that's you're gonna tell everyone that now on top of like all the other stuff that they have to deal with every day like just trying to like make it you also need to carry around like a ceramic pot and a ceramic cup so that you don't generate waste when like it's like putting the, the personal the burden on each individual person but it's just a way to keep anything from changing so if you instead like make changes to the entire system it would be so much more effective and you stop you stop like layering more and more burdens on individual people and telling them that they're failing and that's why there's trash in the ocean and not just that the most you know, important, you know, go ahead. Oh, not that like 10 companies are responsible for like a giant fraction of, 
of CO2 in the atmosphere and that it's because of the way that society like and capitalism have been structured that's responsible for trash in the ocean. And like individual people I think can make a difference, but in, in this kind of thing, like putting the burden on individual people is just a way to avoid accountability on a larger scale. And it's just a way to address that 80%, which is only 20% of the results. By yeah. flip-flopping that, you can have so much more. Uh, uh, duct tape was my favorite thing when I was in university. I studied engineering and it was the best way to fix something was kind of duct taping it together. And that's kind of what society's trying to do now. We're trying to duct tape the system, which is in a lot of senses, well, in a lot of ways outdated. To fix it, we're going to have to change a lot of the underlying system, which yeah. is going to be painful. At, yeah. least we, at least we have the inspiration with uh, automation coming on. We're going to have to make some changes. Yeah, and I, but I think it's useful to just even examine and try and understand the like the underlying system and where it comes from. Um, like in my own work, so I write these proposals to for money um, to NASA or the National Science Foundation. And um, one thing that you're not taught in grad school is about budgets and like how the funding structure actually works. And it was very interesting to learn, like, will you write this budget and you think like, okay, I need to pay this person's salary, I need to pay my salary, I need to pay, you know, for lab equipment and whatever. So you come up with a number, but that number is not the number that you actually submit to the, to NASA. What you submit is that number plus what's called overhead or indirect cost, which is the money that the university uses to keep its lights on basically, and to like pay for staff and to pay for cleaning and, and to pay for a bunch of other things. And so when I was first confronted with that, I was like, well, that's weird. Like I only need a hundred thousand dollars for this project, but I need to ask NASA for like $160,000. And that's like, makes me less likely to get selected because my proposal is going to be a higher budget and whatever. But then when you go back to like figure out, well, why do they do this? Um, it's because there was a choice made after World War II about how government money for basic research was partly going to be funneled through universities. And so this concept of like the overhead was in the original intent that it gives the universities a way to fund themselves and to increase overall the amount of research that they can fund. And so NASA expects it. So it's not like my budgets look worse, but also the university expects it. And that's just the way that the, the structure is set up. Um, whereas if you look at Canada, for example, their federal funding for science research does not have an overhead concept. So the budget that a Canadian researcher puts in is just for their costs. And then the university gets funded through a different mechanism. Um, but which so system is able, better and why? Which is, which what? Which system is better? I have my thoughts, but I'm curious on yours. Um, I'm not really sure. I think as long as you know, like now that I've, I've adjusted to the concept of over overhead, I think it's okay. I think the Canadian system, they just distribute a set amount of money based on the fraction of grants awarded or something to each university. So I feel like in the end, it ends up being the same. Um, and to some extent, the US, the US system is almost like, in all cases, it's like the, it's designed around like winners and losers. So if you win the award, the university knows like, oh, Professor Hamden, she's responsible for this amount of money that's going into the university system. So like, I would get credit for that. Whereas I'm not sure in the Canadian system, it's, it's as focused on like individual people being credited for like, oh, you brought money and you didn't bring money. And it's a lot more like collaborative and collective. Um, so in some sense, I mean, I had a choice. I had a job offer at a Canadian university um, and coming to an American university for a faculty position, it's a little bit of a gamble because a lot of things that are guaranteed in Canada are not guaranteed here. But then I'm, I was also gambling that I want to do these like big giant missions and only NASA can really support that. So I'd rather take the gamble. Um, but I think I went into it with a, a lot of awareness of the choice that I was making. Yeah, and it's interesting. Like people don't typically have that awareness of why their lives are the way that they are, um, like why the structure exists that they have to exist in. And I feel like understanding why is really powerful because it gives you the first tools to then change it. Um, it's like learning the name for a thing gives you power over it. Hence that not realizing your biases and coding biases and problem, same, uh, yeah. similar yeah. concept. Yeah, and like, I mean, you can't necessarily blame people when they're starting out. It's like, you can't expect a fish to know that it exists in the ocean. Like, they don't know that there's water all around them. But at a certain point, you, you should learn. Yeah, especially when you're worth $600 billion. Yeah. So I want to jump into the listener only, um, uh, the patron only bonus questions. If you guys haven't become patrons, 
disruptors.fm slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We throw three to four bonus questions on towards the end of each episode. You guys can get those by supporting us there. Jump back, let's jump back to the actual interview itself. What's one thing I should have asked you about that I didn't? Um, so you should have asked me about how hard is it to put one of these proposals together for a space telescope? Um, Tell me about it. Because it is like the hardest thing that I've ever done. <laughs> and I spent seven years in grad school inventing technology and I would say putting this proposal together is harder. Um, but the thing that's hard and what is like sort of infuriating to me is that it's hard because of it, um, a lack of information about the process and not because it should inherently be hard. Um, so these missions usually about 10 different proposals get submitted. Um, and it's not a lot for astronomy. There's like several thousand astronomers in the U S and so only 10 people ever put these proposals in. Partly, um, there's just a lot of gatekeeping. So I had conversations with people and they were like, oh, this is a really good idea, but it would have been better if you had approached us two years ago about it. And nobody told me like, oh, I should have approached somebody two years ago with this. Like if someone had told me two years ago to do that, I absolutely would have done that at the time, but I just had no idea. And this is the first time that I put in anything like this. And so I'm learning all these rules, unwritten rules ahead of time about um, how early you need to bring in a NASA center as your partner, how early you have to talk to um, different vendors and stuff. And it's just like so infuriating. Um, and like the whole, all of the steps of the process of writing the proposal, there's these different reviews that you go through that are kind of internal, where you ask people to read it and give you comments. And so people will say, oh, have you set up like such and such review? And I'll be like, well, I didn't know that that was a thing, but like, sure, I will do this now. But just the whole, all this, there's actually a very, um, well-developed path to writing these things but if you haven't already done it nobody tells you about it um and that i find like super irritating um and partly that's i think because people are oblivious but also um if you make it really hard then there's fewer people to compete against you and and i also think that's really dumb so um as a result of working on this proposal one of the things i'm doing is setting up a workshop in october um which basically will teach early career researchers, like people who are in, in my stage of their careers, like this is the first year that I've been a faculty member. I'm a, I wanna teach everybody all the stuff that I had to learn and all the doors that I had to kind of bust down um, so that they don't have to do it themselves, that they know like, oh, here are the steps of the process and here's when you should start. And here's like, you know, what questions you should be able to answer. And here's how to make a slide deck to like give presentations about it. And um, I just wanna make it that infinitely easier for all the people that are coming after me. Democratization of access and information. Yes. It's, it's the internet and eventually it goes so far that you have the problems we talked about earlier, but it, yeah. won't, it won't get there for a while. It's, um, it's incredibly important. I wanna, I wanna start to wrap this up and be respectful of your time. Erica, if you had one thing to leave people with, it can be a quote, a call to action, anything. What would it be and why? Um, Oh, that's such a great question. I would say, I think it would be a, a call to action. It would be that, like, you should look at your life and what are you doing with your time? So I've realized that my time is the most valuable thing that I have, that like money is important and it like makes your life easier, but money comes and it goes, but that your time, like one day you're going to die, you're never getting that time back. And so thinking really carefully about how you spend your time and who you spend it on and what you're doing with it and why. And think about if like what you spend your time on is a true reflection of what's in your heart and what you hope to achieve. I bet you guys never expected the astrophysicist to be super deep and have, the, <laughs> have the, all the important questions of, and the meaning of life. You might've thought she would be obsessed with time. <laughs> but that is true and gravity, right? Yeah. Um, that and, and that you should sleep eight hours a night to the exclusion yeah. of anything else. Like sleep is literally the most important thing that you could do. Sleep is pretty darn important, especially for preventing most all disease. Yes. Where is the best place for people to find you, learn more about what you're doing, and then help out if in any way they can? So um, 
I have a web page. It's ehamden.org um, that has some information. It has my CV. It's very academic focused, but I'm also on Twitter. My handle is Erica Hamden, and I tweet mostly about space stuff. And um, I will occasionally tweet about the proposal writing process. If you're curious about how to build a space telescope, you can follow my Twitter account. And I have a, um, a little more fluffy of an Instagram account. That's also Erica Hamden, E-R-I-K-A-H-A-M-D-E-N. And on my Instagram, I post one picture a day to try and find something beautiful in my life. Um, and it's a little more uh, random than my Twitter account, which I would say is very space focused. So you said you're avoiding Facebook, but you're on Instagram. It I seems am. you've been suckered by that old, I know. old classmate. I yeah, know. So. I do wish that my Instagram, I could like turn off the likes and, and just, cause partly it's almost like for me, it's, like I said, I just want to find something beautiful. And so I don't want to know which pictures get the most engagement or like, I want to be able to post a, a picture that I, like right now pictures that have me in them get more likes than pictures that don't have me. But sometimes I just want to post a picture of like a landscape or like an airplane or whatever and not think like, oh, this is only going to get fewer likes than, than a picture that if I like took a selfie of myself. Um, that would be an interesting little extension to block all of the gamification of social media. Yeah, exactly. I think it would be really good, but then it probably results in people using it less. And then yeah, it, it would be so good that you would never use it. Yeah. <laughs> and then we have that problem. It's uh, so yeah. good. So good. You'll never, you'll never be used. Yeah. Erica, this has been, this has been a lot of fun. I hope you guys have enjoyed this. I know I have. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. I've had a really lovely time. I'm glad. And if anyone out there is interested in potentially advertising on the podcast, you've got a product, service, business, et cetera, you think aligns with our values, matt at disruptors.fm. Shoot me an email and we'll chit chat. Until next time, guys, go make it happen and stare at the stars. It's kind of awesome. Space is amazing. Space is amazing. Peace. Awesome. That was good. Thank you. That